Thank you, Seth, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in 1 Peter. We're in chapter 3 this morning. We'll look at verses 8 through 17. Peter has been encouraging, exhorting, directing uh, those to whom he's written to to be submissive in all areas of life, from the government to um, household relationships, family relationships, and now he's going to sum all of this up. That's how he begins in verse 8, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. You, You have a different translation from the New American Standard Bible. Some of these words will translate it differently. I'll maybe comment on that. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Four, and now he quotes Psalm 34. The one who desires life to love and see good, day, good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in prayer. One of man's natural instincts is revenge. People will have their pound of flesh, a phrase that originated in Shakespeare's play, The Merchant of Venice. In it, the moneylender, Shylock, who had a grudge, required a pound of a merchant's flesh if he failed to play to pay a, a lar- repay a large loan. It's an expression that has come to refer to vengeful behavior. And nothing is more common to the natural man, the man outside of Christ, than vengeance, the desire, the need to trade punches and get even. But Peter said, do not return evil for evil, but give a blessing instead. That's the Christian life. It is a demanding life with a high standard. Very different from the life that we see around us. It's about doing good. Simple, but difficult in a bad world. Still, this is Peter's instruction in our text in chapter 3, verses 8 through 17. He begins with positive instruction in verse 8. If I had one word to describe that verse, and really the, the entire passage, it would be graciousness. That should characterize us. 
he begins to sum up, as I <clears throat> reviewed a little bit during the reading of Scripture, he, he has just given instruction on submission in all areas of life, from our relationship to the state, to our relationships within the family. And now he sums up his instruction. All of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. And if we do that, we will do good in a bad world. But the first of, of these five virtues, harmony, is very significant to the rest of the virtues that he mentions. The harmony means to have the same thoughts. And it's significant that, that Peter puts it first because it, it indicates that unity of mind leads to unity in concern and conduct. As Christians, we must know what we believe and why we believe it. If we're not united in our understanding of Christian doctrines, the Trinity and the doctrines of salvation, we will not be unified in our mission. The division occurred early in the church. In the Galatian heresy, when Judaizers, men who professed faith, compromised grace by mixing the law with the gospel, teaching that salvation is by faith plus works, not faith alone. It surfaced again in the debate between Augustine, who taught the sovereignty of God, and Pelagius, who was the champion of free will and man's ability, man's ability to perfect himself. It's the same division that occurred later in the 16th century between the Calvinists and the Arminians. The, the, uh, the Arminians are also known as the Remonstrants, who were students and followers of Jacob Arminius. One of their leaders, Simon Episcopius, was like Pelagius. He had a very high view of human nature and, and ability, and that affected his entire theology. A high view of man will lead to a low view of God. He denied predestination and election, in, interpreted the Trinity symbolically, so didn't believe in the Trinity, and Christ as our ethical model and Christianity as a moral religion. If you have ability to do these things, you really don't need a Savior. And that idea even affects your view of God. But well, today, it's, it's the division between orthodoxy or evangelicalism and liberalism. Now, all of this is to say what we believe matters. If we're not united in the gospel, if we're not united in grace, we are not united. And so Peter emphasizes being harmonious, having, having the same thoughts. There's no real unity in error or ignorance. A church must be of the same mind about the Trinity or about the doctrine of salvation, and we could go on and list other things. And, and the more Christians are of one mind and one purpose, the more they will be mutually sympathetic and brotherly toward one another. That's... Next on Peter's list, the word brotherly is brotherly love. It's translated that way in, um, in some of the uh, other versions. The New International Version translates this, love one another. That, that's the idea. We should have sympathy and love for all people. But first of all, we should have love for fellow believers. Lord Jesus, the night he was betrayed in John 13, said, By this all men will know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. That's not simply affection. I think affection's part of it. Certainly, we should have the 
a feeling of, of affection for one another, but it's also action, maybe it's primarily action. It, it's being glad to help one another. I think that would have been particularly true in their circumstances because their, their, that circumstance they were in was one of persecution. So they were to bear up one another's burdens. But, but to do that and act in that way, we need humility. That's the last of these qualities, being humble in spirit, which involves ideas and attitudes and outlook. It's the opposite of pride, which leads to selfishness. Pride is easy. It's natural. Humility is the product of grace. We pray for it. It's also the result of knowing grace, understanding grace, understanding what God has done for us. Which goes back to being harmonious, being of the same mind. All of that, all of verse 8, is how we are to relate to one another in the church, the Christian community. Next, Peter gives instruction on how we are to relate to the world. And in his day, it was instruction for believers, as I just mentioned, who were living in a hostile pagan world. His message, don't take revenge. There were no doubt many reasons for them to do that to take revenge, and no doubt many of them had that in their mind, and it would have been the natural thing to do, to, to get their pound of flesh. When offended or hurt, that's what we want to do. We naturally want to retaliate, get even. Charles Spencer, the brother of the late Princess Diana wrote a book some years ago titled Killers of the King about the men who executed Charles I and what Charles II did when the monarchy was restored after Oliver Cromwell. Well, he might have shown clemency when he came to the throne to heal the nation after a civil war and division Instead, he used all of his power and his wealth as king to get those involved with his father's killing. He searched relentlessly throughout England, across the continent of Europe, and even in the American colonies until he hunted them all down and gave them all a brutal death. Drawn and quartered. Well, that's an extreme example, of course. What, what, what we um, do is much, much less lethal, at least to one another. We have uh, other ways of responding. More naturally is to respond with a, a personal, uh, um, to a personal offense is to hold a grudge. And that can fester within us or do something. Uh, wrongdoings happen, happen to everyone, and terrible things can occur. They can produce terrible results to the victim, as it were. But Peter's message to, a, to us, regardless of our circumstances in life, but, but see them against the background of this letter, his message to a persecuted church in other words, a church, people in the most difficult of circumstances. We're not in that situation. But to those in the most difficult of circumstances, his message is not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. And that's true for us. That response is the imitation of Christ. And Peter wrote of that earlier in chapter 2, verses 21 through 23, where he told his readers, told us as well, to follow in Christ's steps, who, while being reviled, did not revile in return. What he did, 
is trust his father. Trust in the Lord. That's what the Lord taught us to do in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Peter, Peter got all of this from the master himself. So it is the right way, and therefore it is the best way. It may be the hardest way, but it's the best way. Revenge will destroy the avenger. It will eat up a man's soul. That's the lesson of Moby Dick. If you've ever powered through all 600 pages, you know that. Uh, if not, well, it's about Captain Ahab who chased a great white whale across the globe because it ate his leg. Now, that would make anyone mad. <laughs> but he was seeking his ton of flesh. His soul was consumed with revenge. And in the end, it destroyed him. The whale carried him and his ship down to a watery grave. Well, that's a story. But it illustrates a truth. So the Lord's instruction to, to love our enemies and Peter's counsel to give a blessing instead of an insult is good medicine. Medicine for the soul. That's a healthy response. Grace instead of aggression. A caveat to this is, this is not a prohibition against seeking lawful restitution or a, a remedy to an injury at a, in a law court. That's one of the purposes of government that Peter set forth in, his, in this book in chapter 2, verse 14. The government is, in its intention is to keep order. It is to, as he puts it here, to punish evildoers. What this is a prohibition against is personal revenge, retaliating. We are to pray for the enemy, not kill it. Pray for the hostile. Pray that God would grant repentance and faith to the unbeliever and turn the enemy into a friend. Now, Again, you're probably sensing what I sensed as I prepared all of this and thought about this. That is hard to do. These are difficult requirements of us. A high and difficult standard. That's just the fact of life. This is not an easy life that we are to live. It's hard not to brood over wounds suffered, especially when, when great harm has been done. We need grace to do that. And so I say that, that grace is assumed through all of this. These are things we cannot do in our own strength, but we are to do them. The encouragement Peter gives is the, the promise of a blessing for such gracious conduct. That, I think, is, is clearer, perhaps, in the New, Ameri the, the New International Version or maybe the uh, English Standard Version, which give good translations of the original text, uh, the New International Version. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. It is our calling from God to live this way in a hostile world. Some, say, some saints have been called to debate and expose the error of skeptics. God has, has given them a mind like a steel trap, quick and understanding. They're apologists. They're defenders of the faith. Now, not all of us have that kind of, of mind, but all of us know the truth. We should. And all of us can articulate it, speak it clearly. At least we should be able to do that. And the Holy Spirit uses that effectively in the unbeliever's heart. And all of us can, by the Spirit, behave graciously. Graciously. 
It's a witness of divine life. It's a, a witness to the reality that you are a changed person, that there's something different about you. And such behavior, doing right, as, as Peter put it back in chapter 2, verse 15, may silence the ignorance of foolish men. They cannot argue with that, with a gracious life and a gracious response. And the Spirit uses that to win the lost. But regardless of how hostile people respond, we can't control that. God has called us to live graciously, to be a witness to the world in that way, and He will bless us for it with eternal, glorious blessing and reward. So much of life for us is a test. Regardless of the, the results of that, it's a test. And God blesses those who are faithful, regardless of the results around us. And the promise is that He'll bless us with reward. That's, that's a great encouragement and incentive. Whatever we might suffer or lose in this oh-so-brief life is more than regained in eternity. God blesses us beyond anything that we might think we deserve. It's the life He has called us to because it is the life of Christ in whose steps we are to follow. And if He has called us to that life, difficult life, then He will supply the grace to do it. We live by faith. One example that I've often cited, but it comes to mind in light of this difficult standard that He set before us, is Joshua chapter 3, verse 15, when Israel is now about to cross over the Jordan River into the promised land. They're about to receive their inheritance. And it's the priests that lead the way, and they're carrying the ark. And the problem is they come to the Jordan River, and it's overflowing its banks. It's a raging flood. And what do they do? They've been told to cross. They don't stop and say, well, we're going to have to wait a while on this. It says the priest stepped into the river and as the sole of their foot touched the river, the water, it suddenly backed up. Now they didn't know that, they didn't experience that until they stepped out, until they stepped forward in obedience to the Lord God. And I think that's the life of faith. That's at least one example of the various ways we live by faith. They step forward and the blessing occurred. And that's how we're to live. We live by faith and as we do, we will see God's blessing. All of that is the basis for living this life of grace and non-retaliation. But Peter also had Scripture to support what he has taught here in verses 8 and 9. It's Psalm 34, verses 12 through 16, which he quotes next in verses 10 and 12. In the psalm, God promises a blessing for right behavior in times of opposition. There is an answer in Scripture for every issue that we face in life. It may not be clear at, uh, at first blush, it may not be clear in our first reading, but as we read through Scripture, as we study the Scripture, we gain God's wisdom and we learn chapters and verses and texts that apply to various circumstances in life. We just need to study the Scriptures to know that and have the wisdom of God. And Peter had done that. Peter was a man of the Word of God. He knew the Old Testament. That was the Scripture, the Bible of the early church as the canon was being completed. And so he finds justification for what he's saying here for these difficult decisions that we must make, these difficult requirements. He finds justification for that 
in Psalm 34. And that's what he quotes. So it's, I think, a way of saying, this isn't coming just from me. This is, this is God's will. And you see it throughout the Word of God. And so he writes, for, here's my basis for what I'm saying to you. Psalm 34, the one who desires life, to love and see good days, must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. That's the way the world lives. That's the way it does things. We're not to do things that way. Don't try to deceive. Don't dissimulate. Don't try to fool people. Just be straightforward. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and His ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The emphasis in verse 10 and the first part of verse 11 is on avoiding evil and the stress in the second part of verse 11 and verse 12 is on doing good. So avoid evil, do good. That's the gist of the psalm. Life and good days in the psalm refer mainly to uh, the earthly life and happiness and how to have a, a, a proper life. Though I don't think it's limited to that. Uh, Peter's meaning, I take at least, is going beyond that this temporal life to heaven and to the world to come. But it, it is still true that in this life, being good to others leads to seeing good days and having a longer life. Generally, when we avoid sin, we avoid harm. Now, that's not guaranteed. That's not, uh, uh, this doesn't guarantee a, a trouble-free life. Toward the end of the psalm, in verse 19, David wrote, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. They often suffer for doing good. That's the issue here in 1 Peter. Suffering unjustly. Suffering for the faith. But in affliction for doing good, there is peace. That's the... the the kind of, of life the Christian is to desire and seek. And it's a, it's a better life than one that obtains great prosperity, but comes with it a, a heavy heart of guilt and regret. So as the, the psalm says, the Christian must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. That's really the good life may not be the materially prosperous life, but it's the good life, a life of peace. But it's more than that. It's also the most, and most importantly, it is the wit a witness, a good witness to the world around us. And we have the encouragement to do that from the fact that the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. That means more than, than God sees what we're doing. He sees what everyone is doing, believer and non-believer. Peter means he, God is looking after us. He is attending to all of our needs. And by contrast, he is against those who do evil. He will deal with them. He will deal with them in His time. In the meantime, we are to trust Him and do good. And that's part of the test of faith. Are we going to be honest? Are we going to, are we going to live an honest life before the Lord? Even though it's difficult to do that and challenging. Now, the emphasis here on doing good and pursuing peace does not suggest that salvation is by works. Peter was writing to people who were already saved. And that's also clear from the psalm itself. Earlier in verse 8, David wrote the familiar statement, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That, that means trust in Him. Believe in Him. Begin with faith in Him and His promises, and you will experience His goodness and His faithfulness. 
He is the great deliverer, according to verse 19 in the psalm. Everything that Peter says in quoting the psalm presumes faith and grace. It assumes salvation. This is the life of the saved. This is the life of the child of God, the people of God, seeking peace and doing good, being gracious to others. And generally, those who do good and obey the law will not be persecuted. Verse 13, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? This begins a new section of the book on suffering innocently, suffering for the sake of the gospel. Normally, people who do good, who live peacefully, live lawful, orderly lives, don't suffer hostility. That, that's the Christian life. Peter, uh, rather, Paul told the Thessalonians, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands. That's a peaceful life and a life that promotes peace with others. But there are exceptions. Christians do suffer for the sake of righteousness. And if that happens to you, Peter said, you are blessed. That seems odd. Blessed if I'm persecuted. But the Lord said the same thing in, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. We, we are blessed when we suffer for righteousness' sake because we are children of God. And, and that is the evidence of it. We're suffering for Christ. And, and that is evidence that we are born again. Children of God. We're, we are blessed because of God's present favor for us in such a circumstance. He hears us. He attends to us. And we are blessed because there is great reward for such suffering. Then, referring to the persecutors, Peter wrote, and do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. This is another of those seemingly impossible expectations of the Christian life. But then Peter gave the alternative to fear in verse 15, focusing on Him, fixing our minds on Him. That, that is the alternative to fear. That is the way to power in the midst of difficulty. Uh, being devoted to Him. As he puts it, sanctify Christ as Lord of your hearts. But that involves knowing him. That involves knowing who he is, what he's done, that he is the God man, very God of very God, the eternal Son of God, second person of the Trinity. We worship one who is, we worship the one God in three persons. God who, who exists in three persons. That's, that's the mystery and the reality of God. But knowing it is true, we regard Christ, God's Son, as holy and to be worshipped and to be obeyed. And with the knowledge that He is all-powerful and reliable. And the knowledge that He will never forsake us. He says that in various ways, but we find that very clearly in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. As fearful as man can be, and man can be a monster, doing monstrous evil. Still, Christ is God. Not God the Father, but God the Son. And we are always safe in His constant care. All will be well. That's the promise. That truth calms fear and it gives stability in unstable times. 
But it does more. It, it girds, it, it prepares the mind for action to be a witness for him to unbelievers. So we're to sanctify our minds with Christ, focus upon him. Peter continues, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Now, and this is a question that the interrogator asks because he has seen something in the Christian life that's different. An inward hope that sets him or her apart from other people, from unbelievers. That happens when, when we live according to the instruction of verses 8 and 9. Humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil, but blessing our enemy. And such unworldly behavior prompts the worldly person to ask, why? Why is that? What is this hope that you have? And we must be ready to answer when, when that kind of a question is asked. And we must be ready to answer with a clear statement of the gospel. So, the, the implied exhortation here is live well and be prepared. The opportunity may come unexpectedly. And so, Set your mind on Christ. Fill your mind with Him. Think on Him. Sanctify. Set yourself apart through the thoughts of Him. And that prepares us for the unexpected. In, in the case of Peter's friends, the, those to whom he's writing here, the occasion to defend the faith and, and give the reason for their Christian hope may have been, there's a context I think would suggest this, persecution. And the, the, the question that must loom in the mind of the enemy is how can this person be hopeful while facing death or something else? The confiscation of his or her possessions. Paul's opportunity to give the right response and speak of the hope uh, came that he had came when he was on trial for his life before the Jews in Jerusalem then before Festus and King Agrippa in Caesarea, and finally before Nero in Rome. And there in Rome, he stood alone. But the Lord stood with him and strengthened him, so that, as he wrote to Timothy, through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished. And it was. With that august, frightening audience, the emperor himself. Well, regardless of the circumstances, we're to be prepared to answer our critics and inquisitors and questioners clearly and tactfully, politely. The way we answer is equally important. Peter made that point here at the end we are to be gracious. He wrote, be ready to make a defense, yet with gentleness and reverence. Paul was an example of that in Caesarea, in Acts chapter 26, after giving a defense of the hope that was within him, speaking of the resurrection of Christ. His resurrection guarantees our resurrection the resurrection of every believer. He, he speaks of that, of that. He speaks of the resurrection of the, of the dead, of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Festus, this Roman governor, this materialist and skeptic, had heard enough at that point, and he shouted Paul down. Paul, you are out of your mind, he said. Paul, you're a madman. Talking about the resurrection. Paul didn't get angry. He calmly responded. He was not out of his mind. What he was speaking of there before the governor and the king and the king's consort, Bernice, and a whole host of august, important people. It was a 
big occasion there in Caesarea. The things he was speaking of, he said, were not done in a corner. These things were done openly. Everybody knows about this. This was common knowledge. Now that was a great defense. There is ample evidence for everything I'm saying. Festus, the evidence is there. In fact, he goes to the king, to Agrippa, and he says, Agrippa knows these things. The king knows this to be true. But when he challenged the king, do you believe the prophets? Agrippa knew the prophets. Do you believe them? Agrippa became uncomfortable. Now it's become very personal. And he shut things down with, in a short while you will persuade me to become a Christian. And I'm sure there was some laughter in the audience. He was mocking Paul. He was mocking the very idea and trying to get off the subject. But Paul was gracious to him. He said, with all sincerity, with great emotion, I imagine with tears in his eyes, I wish to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am except for these chains. Couldn't have been answered better than that. Those people saw those chains on his wrist and wondered, this man is a prisoner. This man is in chains, but he's boasting about his life. He's speaking about the greatness of his life and wishing we could join him. Well, all of that reflected who Paul was, the kind of man he was. By the life-changing grace of God, he had been changed from a religious zealot to a lover of Christ and a lover of men's souls. He cared, he cared for those men before him and all of those around him. And that will happen to us as we walk with the Lord daily. Read and study the Scriptures and pray. It's a lifelong process. But as we follow it, we are prepared for unexpected moments to witness for Christ. Consistent with that, Peter added in verse 16, keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. We will never be perfect in this life, but we will do what Peter instructs here by avoiding willful sin. We struggle against sin, we fight against it, and we gain the victory. Not always, but we do gain the victory. And when we do sin, as we will, as we all do, as we do every day, we confess it to God and pray for forgiveness, according to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Earlier, Peter told husbands to honor their wives so that their prayers would be unhindered. I said last week that uh, that really, in my mind, puts the greater burden of responsibility on the husband than the wife. If a husband will do that, honor his wife, lift her up, her responsibilities will be so much easier. That's the husband's responsibility. In Ephesians 5, it's love your wives as Christ loved the church, which is totally sacrificial. So he's made this, he's set forth these responsibilities for husbands and wives, and here he instructs people generally to keep their conscience clear so that their witness will be unhindered. Persecutors will be put to shame by such an example by the example of obedient Christians, meaning they will be silenced by a Christian's good behavior, that the result might be they consider the gospel and believe. That is probably the point Peter makes in verse 17, uh, the thought at least behind his statement in verse 17, where he takes up the subject he had taught earlier in chapter 2 about suffering unjustly. Verse 17, For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer 
for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. The reason it is better to suffer unjustly is uh, 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 rather than suffer justly, obviously, is just suffering, deserved suffering. Suffering because we're guilty of something discredits the gospel, while unjust suffering has reward for glorifying God and by that being a witness to others that will possibly lead to bringing them to faith. Now, there are examples of that from church history, and one, I'm sure I've referred to this before over the years in which I've taught, because it's so dramatic, but uh, is that of, of Polycarp, who was uh, the old second century bishop of Smyrna, one of the seven churches of Asia Minor listed in Revelation 2. He was a disciple of the Apostle John and late in his life was arrested by Roman authorities and told to deny Christ or die. He answered with gentleness and reverence. That is the standard of verse 15 here. And his answer was, Eighty and six years I have served him, and he never did me wrong. And how can I now blaspheme my king who has saved me? That was his testimony. That was his response. And he was burned at the stake. But before that, when he was first arrested, his response was, was calm and dignified. He surrendered with the words, God's will be done. Then he showed his persecutors kindness. They were hungry, so he fed them a meal. Then he prayed for them, and he prayed for the church. Well, that, that it really goes beyond anything we read here, but that's Peter's instruction. Be gracious to those who persecute you. Can I do that? Well, again, I, I've pondered that question as I've gone through this. Can I do that? Well, I can answer this honestly, not in my own strength, only in His. But that is true uh, of all things Christian. It is a supernatural life. We can't live this life any other way than by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we think on Christ, we're sanctified and we are empowered more and more to do it. We work out our salvation. We do it. We are responsible to do it. We live faithfully because, as Paul told the Philippians, it is God who is at work in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. And part of working out our salvation is doing what Peter instructed in verse 15. Again, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Recognize His reality in all things, His greatness, His dependability, and follow Him. And grow in your relationship with Him. But to do that, you must first come to Him. Believe in Him. If you're an unbeliever, but hearing my voice, turn from unbelief to Christ. Trust in Christ. You will find, as old Polycarp did, that he will never do you wrong. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Never do you wrong, only good. Only the best. He will receive you. He will forgive you. He will make you a child of God and He will give you eternal life with a glorious inheritance. May God help you to do that. Help all of us to sanctify Christ as Lord of our hearts. Well, let's stand and sing hymn number 24 in the Songs of Praise book, O My Soul. Hymn number 24. Father, we look forward to that day when we will be with you, when we will see Christ face to face. What a day that will be.
And help us to long for that day. Help us to become increasingly detached from this world, at least in our love for the things of this world, and long for that day when we will be with you, when we will be in the presence of Christ, and we will be transformed by that. It's all of grace, and we thank you for it. And as believers in Him, as your children, as sons of God, we have that glorious future, that glorious inheritance. It's all because of your grace. We thank you for it. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.